Okay, now in this class, this is class two. If you weren't here, you really should hear class one. But in this class, I'm, I'm sharing with you my understanding of why it's sinful for Christians to use instrumental music in the worship of God. I mentioned last week, I said, though I'm convinced it's sinful, that doesn't mean people who disagree with me on the issue are, for that reason, bound for hell. Okay? I don't buy the dichotomy of hell and trivial. There's other things at work. So something can be significant and still not be that if you disagree with me, then you're lost. Because I say, if we start with that, there are many questions and issues we could go through, and every one then means somebody's going to hell in a disagreement about it. And you can't have studied the Bible very long to understand that there are a lot of things that can cut different ways. And if you start saying everybody who's wrong about anything is lost, well, you know, that just doesn't make sense to me. So, But I went into all that last week. Now, last week I made the point, if I turn this on, there we go. Last week I made the point that musical instruments were common in the first century and were used on all sorts of occasions in Greek, Roman, and Jewish cultures and especially in religious activities. But despite that fact, they were universally absent from Christian worship for many centuries, probably for the first 900 plus years of the church, and then came to be used only in the Western church. Only there, and this is recognized by the vast majority of historians of music and of the early church, a fact I, dom I documented with numerous quotations, maybe more than you cared to see. But there's a method to my madness. I wanted to have that sink in. Now, I explained that this scholarly consensus, it's based on the New Testament and on the non-canonical writings of early Christians writings of early Christians that are not part of the New Testament. Now, as for the New Testament, I pointed out that musical instruments, musicians, or instrumental music are never mentioned as being part of Christian worship, though singing is mentioned on multiple occasions. And when Paul mentions the flute and the harp in 1 Corinthians 14, 7, he describes them disparagingly as lifeless. And when he describes in Ephesians 5.19 how Christians make music to the Lord, he says they do so with their hearts. See, singing and making music to the Lord with flute, lyre, harp, something else? No, singing and making music with their hearts. He makes no mention of musical instruments. Now, this New Testament evidence, it indicates, or at the very least, it creates a suspicion that instruments weren't used in the worship of the apostolic church. And as we'll see, that suspicion is confirmed by later Christian writers. Their testimony, it informs our understanding of the New Testament evidence, and it solidifies the conclusion that instrumental music was in fact not used in the worship of the early church. That is what drives the scholarly consensus. It is the New Testament indication and the confirmation by these later writers. Now, as I said, that conclusion that the apostolic church didn't use instrumental music in worship is very significant because it demands an answer as to why. Why were instruments not used in Christian worship when everything would lead you to expect that they would be? And seeking to answer that question, which is going to be the focus of the class, that leads to an understanding of why instrumental music in Christian worship is wrong that is deeper than, or in addition to, the argument against the use of instruments that one commonly hears in churches of Christ. Now, I assume you are familiar with the common argument that is made, but I want to sketch it briefly for you just to refresh your recollection. You may not have seen it laid out in precisely the way I'm going to lay it out, but I think my sketch fairly captures what is being claimed in that argument. And after I briefly review this more familiar, more common argument, we'll then look at the writings of early Christians that confirm the non-use of instrumental music in the early church. 
All right, the first thing in the, in the common argument, I'm clicking this bad boy, but he's not working. There you go. So maybe they just see me pressing and then they do it. I don't know. All right, the first point is that in this argument is that God cares about, is particular about the way in which he's worshipped. You see, it is not true that he cares only about the worshiper's heart or motives so that the manner or the way of worship is a matter of indifference to him. That's the first point. And you say, well, why would you think that? Well, the second commandment, for example, in Exodus 24 and 5 and Deuteronomy 5, 8 and 9, it prohibits worshiping God, Yahweh, by means of images in addition to prohibiting the worship of any false gods by means of images. It's an expression of God's particularity regarding the manner of worship. And the classic violation of this particular aspect of the second commandment was the golden calf that Aaron fashioned in Exodus 32.4, which was intended to represent Yahweh, the God who brought you out of Egypt. So he makes, he does an image of him, and that's not allowed. And that demonstrates or expresses particularity on God's part about the manner or way in which he's worshipped. Deuteronomy 12, 4 and 12, 31, God tells Israel expressly that they are not to worship him in the way. They're not to worship him in the way the Canaanites worshipped their gods. He has his own way of being worshipped. He has his own desires for how his creatures are to worship him. And God continues to care about the way in which he's worshipped in the New Testament. For example, Jesus makes clear in John chapter 4 verse 21 that in the New Covenant, God no longer wants worship to be at a physical, centralized location. Whether it's Jerusalem or Gerizim. And at 424, he makes clear that the manner of worship must be in spirit and truth. Now, I'll have much more to say about that particular text later, but the, the point for now is that whatever worship in spirit and truth means, it's a New Testament limitation on how one is to worship. The manner of worship continues to matter to God. That's why the Hebrew writer exhorts us in Hebrews 12, 28 to worship God in an acceptable way with reverence and awe. We see elsewhere in the New Testament that God continues to have objective desires regarding the manner of worship. It is not the case that anything goes so long as the worshiper means well. That's how we've come to think of it. As long as the worshiper means well, subjectively, then it doesn't matter the way in which he or she worships. And that's not the case. For example, if a woman prayed in the Corinthian assembly without a head covering, she would be worshiping God contrary to God's will, regardless of her heart or motives. 1 Corinthians 11, 2-16, and if a tongue speaker used his miraculous gift to praise God in an assembly in which there was no interpreter. He would be worshiping God contrary to God's will, whatever his subjective intentions or state. But I meant this. God has objective desires and he would be worshiping God contrary to his will. The worshiper's heart or motive doesn't baptize every form of worship. It doesn't trump God's desires for how he is to be worshipped. So that's the first point in this more common argument. And the second point, if I can get the second point, there it is, is that God has revealed ways of worshiping that he desires or accepts from Christians. The Christians are commanded to worship God corporately with singing, praying, observing the Lord's Supper, teaching slash preaching, and scripture reading, which is usually part of teaching and preaching. And we see them doing that throughout the New Testament. And they're instructed to contribute funds voluntarily 
on the Lord's day for use in a God-glorifying work. So we can be confident. We can be certain that worshiping God in these ways is pleasing to him, assuming, of course, it's heartfelt. That's a given. But we can be certain that, that worshiping God in the ways he has revealed that that is something that is pleasing and acceptable to him as is contributing financially to good works. He has revealed, he has let us know that he desires and accepts these things. Next point. Given those two things, and that's the context, given those first two points, you see that he cares about the way in which he's worshipped, and he has revealed ways of worshiping him that he desires, it is more reverent to worship God only in ways he's indicated he desires than to worship him in whatever ways he has not affirmatively prohibited. Okay, put differently, it's more reverent. It is more respectful of God's greatness and his glory to stick with what God has revealed he wants in terms of worship than to risk giving him something he does not want by innovating, by worshiping in ways he has not revealed he wants. Now, the risk of displeasing God that is inherent in worshiping him in ways he has not revealed he wants, it seems obvious. Because he hasn't revealed he wants it, so there's a risk you're going to offer him something he does not want. It seems obvious, but it can be illustrated simply. If I ordered a hot dog with ketchup and mustard and the vendor, acting according to his personal preference, gave me a hot dog with ketchup, mustard, and mayonnaise, I wouldn't be pleased. I may appreciate that he meant well. But that wouldn't alter the fact that he had given me something I didn't want. He had given me something I did not want. Now, to risk displeasing God needlessly. And the risk is needless because he has revealed desired ways of worshiping him. If I worship him in those ways, I know it's going to be pleasing to him. So to risk displeasing God needlessly for the sake of your personal worship preference. That says that displeasing him is less important to you than being able to express yourself in worship in the way you want. That's more important than displeasing God. You see, that shows less reverence for God than foregoing your desires regarding worship to ensure that he's pleased with the offering. And you can see this in an example. If a woman knowingly risks a miscarriage by insisting on behavior she enjoyed, she'd be showing less respect for and appreciation for the baby she's carrying than a woman who abstained from that behavior to avoid that risk. Right? The latter person's behavior would say the baby's life is more important than her personal preferences. Well, that's the idea. It's that pleasing God is more important than my personal preferences. Now, in addition to the limitation on the manner of worship that arises from the nature of reverence, there are confirming indications in Scripture that God opposes this kind of human presumptuousness in worshiping him, opposes humans worshiping him however they see fit as though he's obligated to accept and be pleased with worship in whatever form we wish to give it, however we choose it. If I want to do it and my heart is I'm going to work, how, the form is up to me. Okay, so there are, in, there are things in Scripture that indicate that's not the case, that he's opposed to that kind of human presumptuousness. You see that in his displeasure with Nadab and Abihu and offering fire. And the key phrase in Leviticus 10.1 is this, which he had not commanded them. Offering fire, which he had not commanded them. They were killed not for violating a specific prohibition, though many claim that, 
but for presuming to worship God in a manner he had not indicated was acceptable. Timothy, Timothy Ashley, in his commentary on Numbers, in the New International Commentary on the Old Testament, he says, Nadab and Abihu offered incense in an improper manner before Yahweh and were consumed by fire from his presence. The problem was not that they offered incense when they were not qualified to do so. Chapter 8 relates their ordination as priests with all the rights and privileges of priests. The problem was that they offered incense that Yahweh had not commanded them. Leviticus 10.1, they made this offering on their own, of their own free will, not in response to God's command, thus the fire was unacceptable or unauthorized. This guy doesn't have anything to do with the churches of Christ as far as I know. Okay? So when you, when you say these guys, oh, that's just some kind of tendentious, parochial, church of Christ perspective. And this guy's writing in Nicot. So it's not a silly idea to understand Nadab and Abihu as saying, look, this is what's actually going on, given the language of Leviticus 10.1. God's opposition to human presumptuousness and worship is also seen in the implied condemnation of Jeroboam for, among other things, establishing a religious feast, quote, in the month that he had devised from his own heart. In 1 Kings chapter 12, 32 and 33, Dale Ralph Davis in his commentary says, this is the writer's point about Jeroboam's religion. It is sheer invention. Why lend any credence at all? Why lend it any credence at all? Worship either rests on the prescription of divine revelation or on the preferences of the human heart. It sounds simplistic, but it's scriptural. So that's the, that's the third point. And then the fourth point is Christians are to exhibit utmost reverence toward God in their worship. Indeed, the Hebrew writer instructs us in 12, 28, and 29, Therefore, since we're receiving an unshakable kingdom, let us have gratitude with which let us worship God in an acceptable way with reverence and awe, for indeed our God is a consuming fire. Now, Charles Spurgeon, I mentioned this to you last week, Charles Spurgeon was the greatest Baptist preacher, Baptist preacher of the 19th century. He preached for 38 years at a large congregation in London and commenting on this text in a sermon he delivered in January of 1882, Spurgeon says, knowing that God is to be served in his own way and in that alone, there ought to be a godly fear as to whether we're walking in his ordinances or are following the traditions of men. God does not care for worship which he has never required at our hands. If a man invents a ceremony, he may think it helpful and instructive, but he has no right to practice it if God has not appointed it. If any of you are practicing rites and ceremonies which are not according to God's word, I charge you cease from such will worship, for the spirit which leads you to practice these things is the spirit of Rome and of Antichrist. If God has not commanded it, God cannot accept it. Not only are we to worship the true God only, which is the law of the first commandment, but we must worship the true God in his own way, which is the spirit of the second commandment. The second commandment, as it, as it forbids all worshiping of God through images, uh, through images, does in the spirit of it forbid all worshiping of God in any other way than he has prescribed. Therefore, when thou standest before the Lord, ask thyself, did he require this service of me? Is this thine way in which he would be worshiped? For if not, it's no better than idolatry and cannot be accepted by the living God. Oh, what fear and trembling, what solemn awe, what sacred carefulness should fall upon the man who draws near to serve and worship the Lord our God. So this is the fourth point, is that Christians are to exhibit the utmost reverence toward God in their worship. Well, then you see how the rest follows. Therefore, Christians are to worship God only in ways he has revealed that he desires or accepts, since that's more reverent than risking displeasing him for the sake of our preference. That's more reverent. So since we're to worship him in the utmost reverence, then we are, to, we are to worship him only in the ways he's revealed he desires or accepts. 
And then next, worship with musical instruments is not among the ways of worship that God has revealed he desires or accepts from Christians. And then finally, therefore, Christians are not to worship God with musical instruments. I assume this is familiar to you. I hope this is familiar to you. But that's basically the gist and the essence of the common argument that is made. Now, I think this more common, this better known argument, I think it has significant weight. But whether you agree with that or not, I want you to realize that the case for a cappella worship is broader and stronger than that. It's not only the absence of any indication that God desires or accepts instrumental worship in light of the fact he's revealed ways that he wants to be worshipped. You see, it's not only the absence of any indication, not simply silence about the use of instruments in light of his having revealed ways he wants to be worshipped. You see, but there's also a positive case for their exclusion. That's why I titled the class, Beyond the Argument from Silence, a Covenantal View of a cappella worship. And as I indicated, the key to this covenantal view of a cappella worship is the conclusion that the apostolic church did not use instrumental music in worship. Now, of course, this more common argument, the one that I've just outlined, it recognizes that instruments were not used. It's not opposed to that idea at all, but that fact is not central to this argument. See, that fact isn't central to this argument. This argument instead relies on the fact that there's no indication they were used. There's no authorization for their use. That's what's central to this argument. Rather than focusing on the fact they weren't used and then seeking an explanation for that non-use. Do you see the difference there? Seeking, so they're not used and what I'm going to spend most of the time doing after we look at the uh, non-canonical Christian writers that confirms the New Testament indication they weren't used, I'm then going to explore with you what is the reason they were not used for 900 plus years. And that's, I hope, going to be revealing to you. Because it was to me, and it turned out to me to be quite powerful. Now, as, I, as I've said, the conclusion of the vast majority of scholars that the early church didn't use instrumental music in worship. This is based on the New Testament and on the testimony of later Christian writers. The former creates at the very least, there's an indication or at the very least a suspicion that instruments were not used. And then the latter, these early Christian writers, confirms that suspicion, rendering it a reasonably established fact which is why you have the historical consensus. You say, well, what's this additional evidence that you keep talking about? What is this additional evidence, these later sources, that confirm the indication or the suspicion from the New Testament that instruments were not used in the early church? Well, let's look at some of them. And the first one, interestingly, is not a Christian. This is a pagan. In about A.D. 112... Pliny the Younger, while he was governor of Bithynia, he writes to the Roman emperor, Emperor Trajan, asking for advice on how to deal with Christians in his territory. And he recounts information that he had gathered about Christians. He'd done an investigation, and he recounts to the emperor information he gathered about Christians from those who had defected from the faith under threat of death. And he says in the letter to Emperor Trajan, which is written in Latin, he says that on a specified day before sunrise, the Christians were accustomed to gather, quote, to sing in turn songs to Christ as to a God. And the word that he uses, the Latin word, desere, means to utter or to vocalize. And thus, when referring to songs, it means to chant or sing. So again, as with the New Testament, we have no mention of instruments, musicians, or instrumental music, and this from a pagan who's reporting to the emperor what he was able to learn about Christian gatherings. And you would think if he had learned that this was part of the gatherings, he would have said that. All right, I understand. So that mean he didn't. He didn't. All right, you, you know, you can keep that up so long. 
You know, you can have so many places where you would expect it to be mentioned that it's not, that it starts to say, well, looks like that is in fact what the New Testament is saying. But in 155, we have Justin Martyr. In his first apology, he said, Martyr says, hmm. he says, we've been instructed that only the following worship is worthy of him, not the consumption by fire of those things created by him for our nourishment, but the use of them by ourselves and by those in need, while in gratitude to him we offer solemn prayers and hymns for his creation and for all things leading to good health. Again, no indication. Mention of music, instrumental music, musicians, uh, instruments. Now, in the late second century, around A.D. 190, we have an affirmative and definitive indication from Clement of Alexandria that the church did not use musical instruments in its worship. Now, Clement, Clement was a Greek-speaking theologian who was the head of a Christian school in Alexandria, Egypt. Clement tells us that he studied under many Christian teachers. He studied under teachers from Greece, Italy, Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. He studies under all of these people, and he insisted that they had faithfully preserved the apostolic tradition that they had received. And so he's a Greek-speaking theologian who heads a Christian school and who had been taught by people from across the empire. And he writes in a work titled Protrepticus, which is also known as Exhortation to the Greek, or exhortation to the heathen, he says there, and he who is of David, and yet before him, the word of God, Jesus, despising the lyre and cathara, which are but lifeless instruments, and having tuned by the Holy Spirit the universe, and especially man, who composed the body and soul as a universe in miniature, makes melody to God on this instrument, of many tones. Now you have to note the echo of Paul's description of instruments as lifeless. Right? You see that echo there and the clear pejorative connotation of that description. Christ despises, according to Clement, the lyre and cathara as they are but lifeless, inanimate instruments. They're lifeless in his work, Pythagogos. Instructor, He addresses how Christians are to conduct themselves at banquets or feasts. And though it's not dealing with a worship assembly, it implies clearly that musical instruments were not used in those assemblies. In a section of the work, Clement first describes the sensuous music of pagan entertainment. And then in contrast to that, he quotes from Psalm 150. And you know Psalm 150, all about praise the Lord on all these different instruments. He quotes from Psalm 150, and he allegorizes the references to instruments in keeping with the non-instrumental nature of Christian worship. Here you have all these psalms where they're talking about praise him on the cathar, the lyre, and all these things. Well, how does that relate to new covenant worship where we worship without instruments? How do we appropriate that? How do we make that relevant to us? Well, the church fathers were notorious for allegorizing the instruments of the Psalms. That's how they did it. They said, look here. Yes, we know that they're doing these things, but now what does that mean in our context? And I'll give you an example of what he says. Clement referring to the, in fact, James McKinnon. Uh, McKinnon, who's the Roman Catholic who wrote his doctoral dissertation at Columbia in 65 on the church fathers and musical instruments. McKinnon says that a failure to appreciate this allegorical exegesis of instruments by the fathers. He says that's, that, that's what's to blame for most of the erroneous claims that you sometimes run across that musical instruments sometimes were used in Christian worship. But here's what Clement says, referring to the psalm, Clement says, the tongue is the psaltery of the Lord. The cathara, he says, is the mouth played by the spirit as if by a plectrum. So like a, a guitar pick. So the mouth is the cathara as though the spirit is strumming it. 
He says, praise him on strings and the instrument refers to our body as an instrument and its sinews as strings. And when strummed by the spirit, it gives off human notes. He says, praise him on the clangor of cymbals from Psalm 150 speaks of the tongue as the symbol of the mouth, which sounds as the lips are moved. So you have this, this idea. Now, Clement writes, he says, for man in truth, is an instrument of peace. While the others, the other instruments, if one investigates them, he will find to be instruments of aggression, either inflaming the passions, enkindling the lust, or stirring up wrath. And after noting that the trumpet, the pipe, the pectides, the lyre, the flute, the horn, the drum, and the cymbal, all are used by various groups in warfare, Clement says, we, however, Christians, we, however, make use of but one instrument, the word of peace alone by which we honor God. And no longer the ancient psaltery, nor the trumpet, the tympanum, and the allos, as was the custom of those expert in war and those scornful of the fear of God who employed string instruments in their festive gatherings as if to arouse their remissness of spirit through such rhythms. See, so he makes clear that this is, this is how we do. We don't use those things. See, so now we have something clear, definitive. Somebody can't just say, well, they're just, it's not that they're not mentioning it. He's saying we don't use them. And he's giving a theological rationale that you're going to see played out that gets underplayed. Oh, no, that's just, no, it's, it's very strong. And I think it's the key. There is a theological rationale here. That these things of old were suited for that time. But we live in a new covenant and things are different. And Jesus says that in John 4. Lord willing, we're going to get to that and I'll explain that. Now, at one point, Clement makes a statement. So you go out and you, you, you know, go out on the internet and you'll run into this and you'll say, oh, the guy didn't tell me the whole story. Now, at one point, uh, Clement makes a statement that some claim expresses his approval of the use of two specific instruments the cathara and the lyre. But as McKinnon says, McKinnon, the Roman Catholic, he's dead now, but he was a, a, you know, a renowned uh, historian of music and liturgy. McKinnon says of that passage, he says, surely the immediate context of the passage as well as Clement's views in general suggests that it is to be read allegorically. In other words, that he's not actually saying that it's okay to use a lyre and harp at a banquet or a feast. That's what he was talking about anyway. But he's not approving those there, according to McKinnon. He says, in light of all that he says, you can't read it that way. You see, and you say, well, why would would McKinnon say that? I mean, Clement, earlier in the same essay, he allegorizes the cathara as meaning the mouth struck by the spirit. And he identifies the lyre as an instrument of war that contrasts with the one instrument of peace, the word alone. So he's going to say that. And then you think he's going to turn right around and say the lyre and the cathar, okay, at bank- banquets and feasts. You see, so uh, we, we use the word alone by which Christians honor God. And immediately after that statement, after that statement, Clement says, uh, he allegorizes the psaltery. As referring to Jesus. And in addition, in the earlier work that we looked at, Protrepticus, he said Christ despised the lyre and cathara as lifeless instruments. Okay, so that's part of what McKinnon says when he says that it is a misunderstanding to believe that he's actually saying it was okay to use those things at banquets and feasts. Okay, but secondly, even if Clement reference was literal, even you say I think McKinnon's all wet, he was saying it was okay to use those things. He's not talking about the worship assembly. He's talking about a banquet or feast, so you couldn't conclude that instruments were present in church. Here is what McKinnon says about that. If Clement's statement was meant to be a real toleration of these instruments, it was intended for extra liturgical devotion rather than for liturgical singing and probably to accompany a non-biblical metrical hymn rather than a psalm. All right, so I just mentioned that to you because if you run across that, somebody say, aha, aha, here's what Clement said. I want to tell you. They're making, this, they're making a lot out of nothing. 
Okay, Clement is clear about how the Christians worship, and they didn't do that. Now, as I already noted, Clement would have been aware of Christian practices. He's the head of a Christian school. He's the head of a Christian school, and he's been taught by Orthodox Christians from across the empire. So he has a good grip on what is Christian practice, and that makes it all the more significant that he declares that Christians don't use instruments in worship, and he does it without qualification, without equivocation, or fear of contradiction, and without feeling any need to address or explain away some contrary practice. To say, oh yeah, but here, but over here, but over here. He doesn't do it. It's simply a given that we as Christians don't do that. And that dovetails with the absence of instruments in Christian worship that is suggested in the New Testament. You see, it, it dovetails with that. So here you have this. In, this is in 190, maybe a century after John. So we have the New Testament's references to singing, nothing. You have the disparaging reference, lifeless. You have making music in, your, in their hearts. And you go, you look at, well, what's, what's Pliny have to say? What's Justin have to say? Nowhere in all these things do you find people playing instruments. Any references to them. Now when we get to 190, we get something definitive that says, listen, this is how we roll. We don't do that. And you have theological indications of why. You see, why we don't do it. It's not a small matter. It's not simply a choice. There are theological reasons that I'm going to develop later. All right, Eusebius. Eusebius was one of the early church's greatest scholars. Eusebius was an advisor to Emperor Constantine. He was a Greek-speaking theologian who was very knowledgeable about the church's history and practice. He was very knowledgeable, having from A.D. 300 to A.D. 325, having written several editions of the first history of the church. So he's there writing in, you know, from 300 to 325, and he's a Greek-speaking theologian, and so he's tuned in to church history and practice, and what do they do? And he wrote the following in his commentary on Psalms, which is after these, this work on his histories. He says, of old, now listen to the theology in this. He says, of old, at the time those of the circumcision were worshiping with symbols and types, it was not inappropriate to send up hymns to God with the Psalterian and Cathar. Back in the Old Covenant... When the Jews were worshiping with symbols and types, it was not inappropriate to send up hymns. To, now it is inappropriate. Then it wasn't inappropriate. He says, we render our hymn a living psalterion and a living cathara with spiritual song. The unison of voices of Christians would be more acceptable to God than any musical instrument. Accordingly, in all the churches of God, united in soul and attitude with one mind and an agreement of faith and piety, we send up a unison melody in the words of the Psalms. We are accustomed to employ such psalmodies and spiritual catharas because the apostle teaches this saying in Psalms and odes and spiritual hymns. So do you see the do you see what this early do you see him saying that as Christians was that the second bill? No. Oh, we see him as Christians saying see that we there is a difference in our worship. Those things that in the old covenant were suitable are no longer suitable, and it has to do with the spiritual nature of our worship. Now I'm telling you, when Jesus said worship in spirit and truth, I'm going to beat that to death. Because I think we misunderstand that. And I'm going to try to explain to you why I think that. But it's this that you're seeing there. And that's what I think launched that. That's what caused them. And you see it developed in the Hebrew writer. You see, you see that. Now, mo many 4th century Christian writers, they spoke disparaging. So we're in the 300s now. You have many of them speaking disparagingly of musical instruments. Arnobius, who was from North Africa...
He asked if God sent souls to earth, quote, so that these members of a holy and noble race should hear, practice music, and the arts of the piper. John Chrysostom, golden mouth. He was the greatest preacher of the fourth century. Chrysostom said, where Allos players are, there Christ is not. And Chrysostom said he referred to symbols and alloy, plural of alos, those, those instruments. He said, where symbols and alloy, along with dancing obscene songs and drunkenness, he referred to them as the devil's heap of garbage. Gregory of Nazianzus, a huge theologian of the fourth century. Okay, Gregory of Nazianzus, he says that uh, he commanded Christians to, to celebrate a feast, not, quote, surrounded by the sound of alloy and percussion, and to, quote, take up hymns rather than timpana. So this, he, he, he recognized Ambrose. Ambrose was another huge theologian. He's the one who taught Augustine. So Ambrose, he contrasted those engaging in prayer and singing of hymns and psalms with those who chose carousing at the same hour. He contrasts those two by asking condemningly, hymns are sung, and you grasp the cathara? Psalms are sung, and you take up the psaltery and tympanum? You see, this idea that they, they aren't fitting they aren't suitable for this worship in spirit and truth, this worship that is new covenant worship. The attitude of the fourth century, it was so extreme that there was a widespread legal tradition that denied baptism to Allos and Cathara players. In other words, if you were going to continue in that, we weren't going to baptize you. Now, it doesn't mean everything in the, that the church in the 4th century thought about instruments is right, but it's indicative, you see, of how, as, as McKinnon said, two things characterize the church fathers' attitudes. Vehemence against instruments and uniformity. They really were opposed to them, and they all were opposed to them. All right, now that's significant. That's significant. Nicaea, he was a Latin-speaking leader of the Western church. Nicaea, now in, in the early 5th century, so now we're in the 400s. In the early 5th century, Nicaea says, only what is material from the Old Testament has been rejected, such as circumcision, the Sabbath, sacrifices, discrimination in foods, and also trumpets, kitharas, cymbals, and timpana, which now understood as the limbs of a man resound with a more perfect music. Daily ablutions, new moon observances, the meticulous inspection of leprosy along with anything else which was temporarily necessary for the immature. Are you seeing the theology? This, this echoes Hebrews. These things that were part of the old covenant that were suitable then passed away with the new. I heard that bell. He says, but whatever is spiritual from the Old Testament, such as faith, devotion, prayer, fasting, patience, chastity, and psalm singing has been increased rather than diminished. There is a qualitative difference. You see, there is a difference and there's something about how Christ has changed the relationship of God and man that we now do this instead of how they did it then. And that's significant, as I say, we'll see it played out. So John 4, Hebrews, we're going to spend a lot of time on that. So when I get through this, I've just got one or two more. When I get through this next week, Lord willing, we will then begin to explore why. What is the best explanation for why the early church didn't use musical instruments when everything would lead you to believe they would. And we just a lot of times just throw up our hands, well, who can say, uh, I'm going to give you a clue. <laughs> okay, I'm going I'm to explain it to you uh, the way I see it. All right, thanks for coming.